Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar. Today is Wednesday, December 21st, and it's two, a little over 2 p.m., but we would like to welcome you to the Self-Directed Services webinar on the overview of tools and technology for FMS Engine and EV. Please keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded. Following the presentation, we will have a Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions in the chat, and they will be addressed accordingly. Next. All right, so let's get started. So first we have here the electronic visit verification, also known as EVV. EVV is a techno technology that verifies services are provided at the right time, to the right place, and the right person. It is required for self-directed services. We also have the telephonic visit verification, which is called Ivory. So the telephonic visit verification or TVV is also called IRI. It's where employees record their time work and they can use their phone to clock in and clock out. Please keep in mind that federally, the Development Disabilities Administration, better known as DDA, is implementing EV and will be effective January 1st, 2023. So here at the ARC, we have the following tools and technology. So we have FMS Engine, also known as FMSC, and this is the overall system that encompasses EV and the participant's employer dashboard. There's also FMS One, which is a portal where participant employers and their employees will use to log into EV and FMS Engine. There's also the EV app, and this app is used to capture electronic time from a smartphone device. The EV portal, this is used in a regular browser, and this is where employees review and approve their time here. Participant employers approve their employees' time. So where you clock in and you clock out, this is where your participant, your employer will approve. And then we have iRe. This is the app used to provide telephonic verification. Employees can use this app to clock in and out. I'm going to turn it over and we're going to have some videos review of all of the tools and technologies mentioned. Welcome to Evie by Ankisam, your EVV apps for compliant visit capture that are easy, quick, and secure. In this video, we will go over the basics of using the Evi mobile app, including getting started with the app, logging into Evi, how to record your shifts or visits, offline shift submission, and some basic troubleshooting within the app. A quick note, workers use the Evi mobile app, participants and representatives do not. If you are not a worker, you can skip this video and proceed to the next video in the series using the Evi portal web app. You will need an FMS1 username and password to use the EVI app. Android users should download the EVI app from Google Play. iPhone and iPad users should download the EVI app from the App Store. After installing the app on your mobile device or tablet, locate the app and click the icon to launch it. The first time you use the EVI mobile app, You'll be asked to share your location. Click Allow While Using App. Evi will log your location at the start and end of your shift. It is not tracking your location during shifts. These locations are part of the information that must be collected to verify your shifts with EVV. After you allow Evi to use your location, click the blue FMS1 button to sign in. You will be redirected to FMS1 to sign in. If prompted, click Continue. You will now sign into FMS1 using your email and password that you set up earlier. Click Log In. The first time you use the app, you will be asked to authorize it. Click the green Authorize button. On the next screen, you will need to select the FI you are working for. For most users, there will only be one option to select. If you work for more than one participant, and those participants are served by different FIs, you'll want to select the FI associated with the participant you want to log a shift for. After selecting the FI, press Done in the upper right corner. 
The EVI mobile app is now set up and you are ready to start logging your shifts. The first screen you see once you've logged in and selected the FI is a list of the participants you work for. Many of you will have only one person listed. Some of you may work for two or more different people. To start a shift, click the checkbox next to the participant you want to log a shift for, then click Start Shift. You will need to click Yes in the pop-up to confirm the selected participant is accurate. The shift has now begun and Evie is tracking the time. If you accidentally start recording a shift, you can click the Cancel button in the top left corner. No EVV data will be tracked or saved. You will need to fill out the fields on the shift tracking page at some point before completing the shift. The fields include information like start and end location, service code, notes, and goals. The fields on the shift tracking page are unique for each FI, so the fields shown here may be slightly different for your program. You can update these fields at any point during the shift, but must do so before ending the shift. At the end of your shift, click End Shift in the top right corner to finalize and submit a completed shift. After clicking End Shift, you'll need to confirm that you want to end the shift, and you will have to select one of three options. End in Complete Shift, End in Start New Shift, or Cancel. Selecting Cancel here will return you to the shift. If you are not connected to the internet, the shift will be stored in the account page until you have connected to the internet again. Instructions for submitting these stored shifts will be covered in the next portion of this video. If you are connected to the internet at the end of the shift, the shift will be automatically sent to the EVI portal website within the next 30 to 60 seconds. If you are working with more than one participant at a time, select all participants you are working with before clicking Start Shift. Once the shift has begun, you can then toggle between participants to enter the field information for each of them. If you are not connected to the internet when you end a shift, it will not be sent automatically. Instead, all of the shifts that could not be sent will be stored in the mobile app. You will need to connect to the internet and complete these steps to submit the shifts to the EVI portal. After starting up the app, from the Participant Select screen, access your account screen by clicking the person icon in the upper right corner. Once on the account screen, you will be able to see the number of shifts that are waiting to be transmitted. If any visits are waiting to be transmitted, click the blue Upload button. Typically, any pending shifts will automatically transmit as soon as an internet connection is available and the app is opened. You should see a message stating that your shift has been saved successfully. You will also notice a link to the Every Portal website on your account page, which you can click for easy access. If you've forgotten your FMS1 password, it is easy to reset. Click on the FMS1 button as if you were signing into the app. Below the username and password fields, there is a link for forgot your password. Just click that link, enter your email address, and click send me reset password instructions. You will get an email in a few minutes with a link to reset the password. In the next video, we will explain how to use the EVI Portal web app. Welcome to Evi by Ankasam. In this video, we'll go over how to log into Evi Portal, view shifts, and approve shifts. If you have not created an FMS1 account yet, please refer back to the welcome email sent to you by your fiscal intermediary or your FMS provider. To log into Evi Portal, you should follow the link provided in your welcome email. That link should bring you to a web page that looks like one of these two screens. You'll need to click the blue Login with FMS1 button or the Login with FMS1 link located near the bottom of the form. Enter your email address and password, then click Login. If you don't know your password or you have forgotten it, select Forgot Your Password and follow the on-screen instructions. After you're logged in, Click the large letter E icon to log into Evi Portal. If you're redirected to a page that looks like this, just click the link to refresh your login and you'll be brought to the Evi Portal home screen.
When you arrive on the home screen, select View All Shifts. As a worker, you will see all the shifts you have worked. If you're a participant or designee, you'll see all the shifts your workers have completed with you or the person you are a designee for. In the middle of the screen, you'll see a series of options that will allow you to filter the shifts. You can use the drop-down box to select a person to filter by. You can filter by a date range, just click in the box, and then select a date using the calendar. You can also filter shifts by status. To view any shift, just click the View Shift button next to the shift you want to view. Once the shift has been opened, you will see detailed information about the shift, including the two people associated with the shift, the length of the shift in hours and minutes, and the service code. Other information about the shift could include goals, notes, ADLs, and the start and end location for the shift. These additional details are different for every program, so your view of this page may look a little different from this sample. Below the shift details is a table that tracks the status of a shift over time and shows who has completed actions to change the shift's status. All shifts begin in the status of submitted. At the bottom of the screen, a series of color-coded buttons are available. Approve shift in green, propose adjustments to shift in gray, propose denial of shift in red, and return to view all shifts in blue. The worker and participant or designee associated with each shift will need to approve the shift before it can be submitted to payroll for payment. Once the worker completes their shift in the EVI mobile app, as demonstrated in the previous video, both parties will receive an email notification that the visit was successfully transmitted to EVI portal. The first person to review and approve the shift in EVI portal will select the green Approve Shift button at the bottom of the shift's view page. This first approver could be the worker, the participant, or a designee. To approve a shift, from the View page, click the green Approve button near the bottom of the screen. On the next screen, there are two optional fields, one for your phone number and one for comments. Typically, you will not need to complete these fields when approving a shift, unless you've been instructed to do so by your FI or FMS. At the bottom of the screen, you will notice two gray buttons. One is Awaiting Confirmation, one is Cancel. Hitting Cancel will return you to the shift's view page without approving. To complete the approval of a shift, click the checkbox to confirm and certify your shift. The Awaiting Confirmation button will change to a green Submit Approval button. Click that button. You should see a message that the shift has been successfully updated. The other person associated with the shift will now get an email letting them know that the shift is ready for their approval. This email contains a link to bring them directly to the shift's view page after they've logged in. When viewing the shift, the second approver will have three options to choose from. Propose adjustments to shift in gray, lock is approved in green, and view all shifts in blue. To complete the approval process, click lock is approved. Again, the optional phone number and comments field are available. The user will need to click the checkbox to turn the awaiting confirmation button to a green lock is approved button. After clicking lock is approved, the shift can no longer be changed or edited and will be sent to payroll for processing at the end of your pay period. If you realize you've accidentally locked a shift, you will need to contact your FI or FMS provider for assistance with canceling or editing that shift. In the next video, we'll review how to deny and adjust shifts in the EVI Portal web app. Welcome to EVI by Ankisam. In this video, we'll go over how to deny shifts and adjust shifts in the EVI Portal web app. There may be a need to deny a shift if a shift was created in error. For example, if a worker accidentally begins a visit for the incorrect participant and completes it instead of canceling the visit. To deny a visit, you will follow the same steps to open the shift in EVI Portal as if you were going to approve it, by either logging into the EVI Portal and clicking on the View Shift button, or by following the link in the shift notification email. At the bottom of the View Shift screen, you'll click the red button, Propose Denial of Shift. On the next screen, you'll be required to select a denial code to explain why the visit is being denied. You may enter a comment, which will be visible to all associated users. Click the checkbox to certify the shift, then click Submit Denial. The shift is now in a state of denied. By viewing the shift's history, you can see this and the person that denied the shift. 
the other party will now receive an email about the denied shift. They will need to log in to review the shift. Upon review, that person has the option to either challenge the denial or lock is denied. If you choose lock is denied, the denial is finalized and the shift can no longer be approved or edited. It will not be processed for payment. Choose challenge denial if you do not believe the shift should be denied. You will be able to add a comment regarding why the shift is accurate and why it should be paid. The participant and the worker will have the option to go back and forth twice with denial challenges before they will need to make a final choice to lock the visit as a denial or not. There could be a few reasons why you may need to adjust a visit. In one example, the worker arrives at their shift but cannot clock in right away because the battery in their mobile device is dead. They would need to clock in late once their phone is charged and their start time would need to be manually adjusted in EVI portal. Other reasons for edits could be that the incorrect service code was selected or a correction to the shift notes. You will want to minimize edits unless absolutely needed. Some states track the volume of edits per user and states have discussed that certain corrective actions could be taken for users who have a high volume of edits on EVV tracked shifts. If you need to adjust a visit, you will follow the same steps to open the shift in EVI portal as if you were going to approve or deny it by either logging into the EVI portal and clicking on the view shift button or by following the link in a shift notification email. Once you've opened the shift, you'll click on the gray button, propose adjustments to shift. On the next screen, Select both an exception code and a reason code. The codes explain why the exception occurred. More than one reason could apply to an adjusted shift, but you can only select one. Choose the reason that best matches your reason. In the example mentioned earlier, where a worker's phone needed to be recharged, the exception is missed clock in and clock out, and the reason is mobile device battery died. To adjust a start or end time of a visit, click on the time field, then adjust the time as needed. On a laptop or desktop computer, you can click the hour and or minutes and then type in the correct hour or use the arrow buttons to move up and down. If you need to switch between AM and PM, just click it to switch between the two. If you're viewing the portal from a mobile device, it is a similar process, but scrolling to select the hours and minutes may look a little different when editing time. Once you've adjusted the time, if no other changes are needed, you can scroll to the bottom of the page where the usual phone number, comments, and checkbox are. Whenever you adjust the shift, it is common to put more detail on the comments box about why the edit needed to be made. Some programs may require that you enter comments. Please keep in mind that these comments will be viewable by anyone that can approve the shifts and that the FI or FMS provider will also be able to see the comments. Users are allowed to go back and forth with adjustments and comments twice before they'll be required to either make a final locked approval or deny the visit. Submitting the changes here will move the shift into an approved state. Each time a visit is edited, an email will be sent to the other party alerting them that the visit is waiting their approval. The user reviewing the adjusted shift will be presented with the usual three options to approve, adjust, or deny the visit. Depending on the choice made, that user will follow the steps explained in this video or earlier videos to finalize the shift. In the final video of the EVI Portal Web App Training Series, we will explain how to create a manual visit. Welcome to Evie by Ankasam. In this final video, we'll learn how to create a manual shift in the Evie portal. Please note, manually entered visits are not EVV compliant, and some states are tracking the volume of non-compliant visits per user. States have discussed that certain corrective actions could be taken for users who have a high volume of non-compliant visits in the EVV system. You'll want to avoid creating manual visits unless absolutely needed. Your FI may ask you to record some types of visits manually, like support brokerage. If your FI or FMS provider has requested that you track sick time or vacation time, which do not require EBV compliant tracking, you will use these same steps to record those shifts. 
After logging in, click on the blue button at the top of the Evi Portal home screen, Create New Shift. You will need to fill out the fields on this screen. Depending on your role and the state you work in, the order of the fields may be slightly different. In this example, we'll look at a manual shift created by the worker. Select both an exception code and a reason code. Choose the best option available for your situation. You can also add additional information in the comments at the end of the form to better explain it. Click on the Start Date and Time field to select the date and time of the shift. The time can be adjusted by either clicking the hour or minute and typing in the time, or using the arrow keys to scroll through the time. Click AM or PM to switch between the two. You must select a time zone for each shift entered. This should be the time zone where you worked, or the time zone where you live if you are recording sick or vacation time. Select the participant associated with the shift in the participant dropdown. And in a few seconds, a consumer enrollment dropdown will appear. Select the enrollment. Select a service code and a consumer response if required. Mark the checkbox for any goals or ADLs worked on during a shift. Add notes about the shift in the notes section. This is where you'd record information about what the participant and worker did during the shift. This is not where you should enter comments about why the shift is being recorded manually. Select the start and end location from the dropdowns. And finally, you'll reach the normal phone, comment, and checkbox field we've seen throughout these tutorials. In this comments box, you should provide further information about why the shift was recorded manually, rather than in the EVV compliant method. Do not record notes about the activities you worked on during the shift in this box. Click the checkbox to certify and click the create shift button. An email will now be sent to all parties alerting them that the shift has been manually created. The visit will begin in the status of submitted and is ready to be approved, adjusted, or denied by the participant following all the same processes that we have explained in the previous videos in this series for approving, denying, and adjusting shifts. Thank you for viewing this video series. You can always return to these videos if you need a refresher for any of the instructions we've explained. If you still have questions about what to do when recording shifts in the EVI mobile app, or managing shifts in the EVI portal web app, please contact your employer and or their FI or FMS provider for assistance. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Morgan. I'm the Chief Program Officer here at the ARC. Um, and <clears throat> we're going to do some, uh, I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, I'm going to start off um, going through some frequently asked questions. Hopefully that will uh, take care of some things that's just based on what we uh, heard at the last webinar. Um, and then I just want everyone to know that um, as you enter questions, um, our team is trying to uh, remove some questions that are largely similar to questions that have already been answered. Um, and so you might not hear your question read verbatim, um, but we are trying to just group them because um, a lot of times people have very similar questions. Um, and if you have a very specific question, um, we just encourage you to put in a ticket where we won't get into the details of anyone's specific situation. It's more generally about the system and the functionality. Um, so let me start with some frequently asked questions. These are sort of uh, not necessarily in any order, um, but so uh, what is the process for participants to begin using uh, FMS Engine? So um, we will be sending, the system will send out credentials, uh, login credentials for people. Uh, hopefully by the end of the week, if not the end of the week, then next week. Um, we're just trying to make sure that we have everyone's, we've, we've imported everyone's information for employees and, and trainings, all that kind of stuff. And so we're just making sure that that's all accurate um, before we take the system live and send those credentials. We'll send an email out once they've been sent out so you know to look for them. And if there's any problems with that or if for any reason we're not going to send them or something like that, we'll also send an email to that effect. So you don't have to reach out to us to get your credentials. Um, just wait until you see that. And then after we send the email saying they've been sent out, if you haven't received them, that would be the time to reach out and put in a ticket um, for someone to get back to you about that. Um, <clears throat> can employees still use paper timesheets or Paycom electronic timesheets? So uh, after January 1st, um, the ARC uh, will not receive, will not process time that's received on paper timesheets and people won't be inputting time directly into Paycom. All time has to come 
to the ARC electronically using um, the, the EVI and the FMS engine system. So, um, so employees could choose, uh, or participants could choose to enter shifts uh, that went through the manual time entry process. So if they wanted to receive a paper, if the employer, the participant wanted to receive a paper time sheet and then enter that time in, they could do that um, for, for the period of time the state laid out um, where they uh, wouldn't be requiring every shift to be EVV compliant. So, so if day one, if there's an issue, there's still the ability to enter those manually before sending it through the system uh, for processing. Um, uh, a participant employer is not capable of acting to administer the participant's duties. I'm an employee. Can I act on uh, his or her behalf and approve time? Uh, uh, employees, everyone should have separate logins. So whoever, the participant would be using their login to, um, to get into the system and approve time. The employee would have a, they would see something separate, different as the employee, but also uh, they wouldn't be the one approving time. Now, now, if a participant wants someone to help them approve time, that's up to them, but the system is set up in a way that they all have different logins. Um, does the app track people all day? It does not. The app only logs your location when you clock in and when you clock out. Um, we talked about uh, how to do manual time entries. There's been a lot of questions about missing shifts or fixing shifts. And so that would use that manual process um, that the videos just covered. Um, those videos are available on our website if people need to watch them again. Uh, what if an employee doesn't have internet access when punching in and out? That was also covered in the video. Um, you can punch in and out and it will save the punches. And then next time you're, uh, you have internet access, it will upload them. Um, if an employee does not have a, uh, a phone, a smartphone to use Evi, then they could use that IVR system, Ivory, um, which is the telephone system. Um, there's questions, people have a lot of questions about uh, clocking out when traveling out of state or, or, or that kind of thing. So it, the system does log your location but at this point, it's not validating that against a known location. So it, it's okay to use the system if you're out in the community or even traveling out of state with someone. Um, you could still use the EVI system to clock in and out. Uh, how does one enter PTO and holidays? Those would be uh, codes in the system to enter in. Or you could, again, they could be done manually by the employer participant if they wanted to. Um, <clears throat> So when, you, when a shift crosses over an evening, uh, you would stay clocked in. I think the system just rolls over automatically. Um, there's questions about that with people who do respite for like a weekend or an overnight shift. Um, <clears throat> all right, sorry. I'm reading through hundreds of questions here. So just give me one more second. Um, uh, we don't have a computer. Can a participant use a cell phone to approve time? and view the budget. A participant, um, a, a participant could use the Ivory system to approve time if all of their employees also use the Ivory system to enter time. If employees use the EVI system to enter time, so the smartphone system versus the call-in telephone number, if, if they use the EVI system, then the participant also needs to have access to it. And, and I don't think you can use the Ivory system to, to edit um, time. So uh, having access for the participant to have access to, um, to the EVI portal would be ideal to be able to do um, some of those functions. Are shifts set up in advance? Um, no, they're not set up in advance. So it, it's more of a real time clock in and clock out. It's not based on any expected schedule. Um, mileage reimbursement and, and vendor payments um, will still be uh, handled in the same way they have been. Um, and then if we, you know, if we move if we change that system, we'll announce that in the future, but for now, they'll still be uh, accepted through those email addresses. Um, the, we are aware that the, um, our payroll calendar has the 1st of January is the, beginning, is the beginning of the second week in a pay period. So we'll accept paper timesheets um, and process them for the first week, which would be the, the last week in December. And then all time from January 1st, on would have to come through um, the FMS engine system. So either Ebby or Ivory. 
Um, Paycom is, um, so someone asked if Paycom is going away. Paycom isn't going to be available for people to enter their time into. Technically, people get paid through Paycom as a payroll system, but, um, but, but people won't be accessing that anymore to enter in their time. Um, this will be the, the only system for that. Um, can a cell phone visit be used for a telephonic visit, so to record a telephonic time entry um, or just a landline? Um, yes, a cell phone or a landline. It just has to um, come from, so the call has to come from the number that's associated with the person. So either the person's home phone or if the person uses a cell phone, but whatever, whatever phone it is, it needs to be something that's going to be with the person. Um, so I, it actually would probably be ideal to be a cell phone if the person's going to be out in the community. Um, or a home phone if, if most of the care the person receives is in their home. Um, someone asked about the um, remote personal support services in self-direction. Um, so uh, I think DDA actually didn't cover that in their webinar, but um, you would um, you could either do a manual time entry and, and note that the reason was because it was a, a remote service, or you could use the Abbey system to clock in and out. Um, and again, you, you would probably just put that in the note. Um, multiple service codes in one shift. So um, a, an employee would need to clock out of one service code and then clock into another. So if they were providing community development services, CDS, for instance, during the day, um, and then they uh, went home with the participant and then that afternoon they were providing personal supports in the home, they would clock out from CDS and then clock back in under personal supports. Um, service codes will be pre-populated based on the person's um, plan. So um, they, they should, they would be in the system already um, and they're not all available for every person. Again, it's, it's unique to that person's plan. Um, if a designee to approve time cards does not reside with the participant or in the state, um, can that person approve timesheets? Um, I mean, ideally you would want, the, so whoever's using, ideally the participant would have control of their account and have, um, and someone could assist them with that. So however that assistance is provided, but it probably makes sense for the person who is approving time cards to have an idea of what, you know, was provided and, and what the schedule was that week, rather than someone who's out of state. Um, uh, do both the worker and supervisor need to approve each shift before it goes for, for payment? Yes, yeah, so the employee would log the shift um, and then the um, participant would log in and approve that time and then it would get processed for payment. Um, someone asked if approvals have to be done daily. Um, they do not, um, it, it's just an option, but um, if people wanna stay on top of it, but. You could approve time as long as it's in line with the um, payroll calendar in terms of when time needs to be transmitted, you know, approved and transmitted to the ARC. Um, should DSP workers have EBI portal? Um, no, they would just need the EBI app. Um, someone asked what's an FI, it's a fiscal intermediary, and that's just generic language that they use in this training. Um, but the, the FMCS, um, or the ARC is, is, would be considered the FBI. Um, um, we will post this webinar. Um, we're gonna post a recording on our website, um, hopefully in a few days. Um, and um, we're trying to gather the questions and frequently asked questions as well to post those. Um, someone asked if the state is willing to pay for internet access. Um, that would be a question for the state, but I don't, I don't believe they are. Um, uh, can an employee log in and out uh, for the shift on the EBI portal and not use the EBI app? Um, Kevin, you might have to jump in here, but I think that um, the employees mostly just use the EBI app. Um, no, you do not. Is EBB for personal support and respite only? Um, so in the, the state's webinar, they've talked about um, the shifts for personal support and EBB being, or 
sorry, personal support and respite being EVV compliant. Um, but it's important to know though that the E timekeeping system um, would be used for so so this system would be used for all submission of time. So so whether or not a shift is itself is EVV compliant um, is different than the time coming through this system. So essentially you would you might have greater latitude to do manual time entries um, in the other services, but um, uh, according to the state's policies, but but all time needs to come through the system. Uh, and that's that's per the state. Um, and it, so backing up in general about EVV. So the 21st Century Cures Act, um, which is what mandates electronic visit verification. Um, was signed, I believe, in 2014, um, and it's been gradually rolled out to different um, uh, state uh, personal support, essentially, system. Uh, you know, it could be uh, uh, personal supports in the home for the elderly, or there's there's multiple Medicaid services that provide similar support to people, um, and an EVV is required for all of those. Um, and so, all the other state services have. Um, become EVV compliant through various methods, depending on the administration for that service. But the requirements for EVV are that the, um, essentially you're verifying that the right, it's, you know, the service is for the right person, that it's the right service and that, um, and it's recording the location again of where someone's logging in and out. Or with the telephonic system, it's um, using the fact that you're calling from that person's telephone number to confirm that you're with the person. Um, so, so that's just sort of general about that. Um, um, sorry, we're getting a lot of repeat questions. Is EVV for support brokers? If a support broker is an employee, um, then they would use the EVI system to, to clock their time. Um, technically, support broker time does not have to be EVV compliant. But again, they're still using the same timekeeping system. So whether they're using the EBI app to log their start and end time of their shift live, or whether the participant is entering a manual time entry, um, it's still going to come through the EBI system. Um, but but technically, support brokerage is not the, the the shift start and end time does not have to be EBI compliant. Um, Per GDA webinar, uh, job coaching is not EVV tracked. Is that a manual entry or not? So for those services, um, they, they don't have to be EVV compliant. So they could be manually entered or you could just still use the EVV app to log those services. It's really up to the participant how they want to, because the participant um, or someone helping the participant but re would be required to do the manual time entries. And so if a participant doesn't want to bother with that and they'd rather that their staff use either ivory or heavy to enter the time so they can just approve it rather than having to manually enter it that's up to the participant um, but dea is not going to be looking for evv compliance on the the start and end time of a job coaching shift is my understanding so is everything except personal support supposed to be annu manually entered so Things do not have to be manually entered. Like I said, you can use the EVI or Ivory system for any of the service codes, for any of the different services. Um, but uh, so again, it's up to the participant. Um, <laughs> hi, Bob. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, here's a question. What happens if there's a problem when this begins on 1-1-23 one, one, and you all won't be available to 1-3-23? Um, hi, Michelle. Um, so uh, like I said, if, if there's an issue, um, the shifts can all be manually entered by the participant. So um, so you know, later in that week, if someone, um, the credentials should be out, like I said, by the end of this week um, or next week for people to, um, to get into the system and make sure everything looks okay. But if for whatever reason, if a participant's, you know, one of their employees is having trouble 
um, whatever the case may be, be just keep a record of those times and then the participant can manually enter those times um, and, and submit them that way. So essentially uh, per DDA's webinar, the, um, the shifts, the time, the stamp on the shift that records the location is the main thing that lets the system know whether it's EVV compliant or not. Manual time entries don't have that sort of location stamp on them. So um, per the state, the um, every shift won't be required to be EVV compliant until a later date. And, um, and so people can do those manual time entries. So they shouldn't worry about day one if there's an issue because we can catch up with that and enter those, um, they can enter those times. Um, uh, yes, again, there is a split time period. Um, so the first week could be done uh, by submitting paper timesheets to the ARC. Uh, the second week, the first through seventh, um, would be done using the EVI app um, and the EVI portal. Um, if, if people need to correct information, um, like so if someone asked about a telephone number uh, that's for the participant that's incorrect, um, please put in a, a support ticket and a, a member of our stakeholder relations team will get back to you to make sure you have the correct number. Same as if um, all the credentials are tied to people's email addresses and so for employees and for participants. So that's why we need an individual email address for the participant. So they have a unique account. And it's not the same as like a parent's account or an employee's account. Um, so if we don't have those, um, please uh, put in a ticket and submit that information to us. Um, what do we do if someone doesn't get paid? So if someone doesn't get paid, uh, you would put in a help desk ticket. We, um, I will say that if time comes through this system and is approved, um, we, you know, we've always, there's always been a few issues um, with payroll. We've had uh, more payroll issues, I would say recently, um, because we're currently processing over 3000 paper timesheets, which means they come in, as you guys know, emailed as typically as PDFs or fax. And just anytime you're processing that many things manually, um, there's a you know the you know a chance that some of them get missed, and so um, it's normally like one percent or whatever is our error rate. But um, this system, there's not really a chance for that, right? Because it's all coming through electronically. We there's much less of a chance for an error rate. Um, now, if someone doesn't get paid because they were um, their trains were expired or something like that, there could be other reasons for that. Um, but um, we don't anticipate system errors if the if the time is approved properly. And gets to us. So, um, but yeah, the, you would put in a help desk ticket for that kind of thing. Um, the credentials, um, when they go out, someone's asking if all the employee credentials will be sent to the participant. And um, no, so that per each person will receive the credentials they need. So, participants will receive emails about creating an FMS1 account, the EVI, and then the EVI portal. Um, and then um, employees receive the email about the, the EVI app. Um, because, it, I mean, I, theoretically, people shouldn't be sharing their credentials, right? Because they'd be sending a, a temp password and everything. Um, do, uh, do I have to keep the app open during a shift? Uh, I don't believe you have to keep the app open. Um, we think you have to stay logged in. Um, so you do would, you know, you'd be logged into your app, but you don't have to stay in the app. Again, it's just logging the start and end time. It's not tracking you during the shift or it doesn't need to. Um, and someone asked about whether their app on a computer would be recording sound or video. It, it does not do that. Um, um, someone asked how team meetings with multiple employees are working simultaneously. I would, uh, I would say that you'd probably wanna enter those as manual time entries. Um, at this point, um, this, our system, on our end, we'll flag it as an overlap. But if you put in the notes, so you'd want to put in the note the reason why, you know, each employee would put, you know, team meeting or whatever, um, so that we would know that not the reason for that. And then when it gets transmitted to the state again, we send them that information. Um, someone asked about a budget item for housing support. Now, there's no code for that in EVI. Um, if your housing support worker is an, if you're receiving housing support. 
the person's an employee, then there'd be a code in there. If you're paying a vendor to do that, then you would submit that as a, as a, a vendor invoice. Um, that we probably have to get more details on that situation. Um, the phone number and the, and the numbers, every, the, the instructions everyone needs for the IVR system will be sent out. Um, they, they might be sent out after the credentials to log into the EFI system. Um, uh, we need to generate essentially unique numbers for people and everything, not phone numbers, but um, user numbers and that kind of stuff and send those out to people. So that might take longer than it takes to send the credentials out for people to log into the EFI system. Um, but again, we'll communicate about that as soon as we have an idea of when that's gonna go out. Um, can you show us where on the website the videos are? Um, if you go to self-directed services, um, all the way on the right is, uh, I think, a tools and technology page. And then there's a link at the bottom of that, that says learn more. Um, and if you click that, it, it should take you to the right place. So yes, someone asked if, we have to, if you have to wait for us to send the credentials. Yes, wait for us to send the credentials before you try to log in. I think some people try to download the app and it's, um, it's, it's better to do it once you have the credentials. Um, do you have to be in someone's house to clock in? Um, no, you do not. You can clock in using the Evi app if you're out in the community with someone, um, either starting or ending your shift in the community or both. Um, because this is new to many of us and everyone's just not getting their hands on it. Um, so like we said, DDA is, um, you know, has allowed essentially manual time entries to be done, um, by participant, uh, employers. So, uh, there is some local room there. Um, uh, so someone's renewal date. The budget is delayed through DDA. Um, yeah, so regardless of where the budget is with DDA, um, I believe DDA will approve, you know, if they haven't approved a budget, unless someone's new to self-direction, but if it's just an annual budget, normally they go into essentially auto extend. Um, and so, um, and uh, the only hiccup for that would be, we do need to receive that updated budget sheet that includes the FMS, uh, FMCS fees. Um, which everyone um, should be working with their CCS and their team to submit that. Um, but um, once we have those, those will be entered. So the old process of um, DDA approving budgets um, sort of goes away with that. Um, and so we, we, we won't be waiting on DDA. Even, even that being the case in the past, DDA would still approve us to continue to authorize services past um, if a budget date if a budget's overdue. What type of training will be available for staff? So we've been sending emails with these webinars and then also some um, in-person training sessions um, that we've been doing. Um, those are over the next couple of weeks, there's many of those. So just look for those emails um, and you can sign up for one of those if you want a more in-person walkthrough. Also, people could put in a ticket for support once they get credentials and start using the system if someone um, notices an error, like they don't believe the service codes are all there that they should have, or uh, they can't see all of their employees or something like that, then that would be um, put in a, a support ticket in our um, stakeholder relations team. We'll get back to you about that. Um, is there a way to set reminders in the system? I don't believe so. Um, someone asked if they can start using every December 25th. Um, if you went into the, if, so there's, there was a group of people who, um, as part of the open enrollment process, um, chose a provider to start on the, um, on 10 one. Um, and so, um, those people should have their credentials and could be using it early. Um, so December, December 25th would be in the middle of a big week anyway. So that wouldn't necessarily make sense. Um, do staff see their paychecks? Um, staff would see the time they submit and then um, they would obviously see their paycheck when they receive it.
Um, The grace, how long is the grace period for allowing manual entry? At this point, my understanding from the state is that the grace period will be extended through July 1st, so a six month grace period on doing manual time entry. And then after that, um, the state uh, had a webinar uh, last week where they walked through sort of the process for how they'll handle that. Um, so I would encourage people to um, check the, um, the state's website for, uh, DEA's website for information on that. And if it's not on now, it'll probably be up shortly. Um, for the pay period two, should we expect two payroll deposits? Uh, no, the payroll deposits for the pay that crosses over will probably still come as one pay. Um, so you won't, you probably won't see two deposits for that. Um, my family member neither has a cell phone or a house phone. Do we need to get one? Um, is there a program for that? So um, if someone doesn't have a telephone, they don't need to use the system, the, the telephonic aspect of the system. They could still uh, prove time using a computer. Um, you, know, you can go to library and log in um, you know, to the web browser and use a computer that way to approve time that was submitted by their employees. If employee has special permission to work a shift remotely, how should they log that? If they're working with a person in a different area, they could still, like a different location, they could still use the heavy shift for that. Uh, can employees use a combination of the heavy portal and IVR? Uh, yes, I believe um, you can use either one to start or end the shift. Can we clock in and out on our phones? Yes, you can use the heavy app on your phone or you can call a number using a telephone to use the ivory system. Uh, someone asked if an employee logs in on their own phone or only on the phone listed uh, for the participant. So if you're using the ivory system to call the 800 number to clock in or out, you would do that on the number that's associated with the participant. If you're using the app on a smartphone, the employee would, would probably use their own uh, smartphone to, to clock in and out. They could theoretically, if the participant they're supporting wanted to offer technology, like if the participant has an iPad, then they could allow an employee to log in on the iPad um, and into the system and then clock in and out using that. So theoretically, an employee could not, uh, would not have to own either thing which that answers the next question. Um, someone said, we've been told that out of state support was not allowed to be charged. That, that would be, if that's the case, if you were told that by the state, I would need to, you probably need to see clarification from the state about that. Um, it was my understanding that people could receive support if they went on vacation or something like that. Um, can the apps only be used on mobile devices? So the apps are for mobile devices. Um, you could, the participant could log into the every portal, I believe on the, uh, on, or the participant dashboard on a desktop computer. Does a representative log into a shift during the time they are managing the EVV task emails and approval with the participant? I don't, I don't know that, I, that would be a question for the state, whether the state sees that as an activity of say personal supports, supporting someone to do that. I would say off the top of my head, which is dangerous. Um, the, if, the, if you're physically assisting a, a participant to do whatever they're asking you to do. That would be, you know, like if they're asking for help with something, that could be personal supports. If you're doing clerical work on behalf of a participant, but it's not really assistance to the participant, I mean, it may help be helpful to them, but it's clerical work and it's, it's not really related to helping the participant do something, then 
that is different. And again, I, you'd probably want to get clarification from the state on that. So once they're asking for a credit and debit card, um, you, it sounds like you're probably trying to log into the app without actually having received credentials from us, because I don't believe there's a there's be no credit or debit card information exchange. So do not proceed with that and uh, reach out to, well, either wait for your credentials if you um, are, if the participant you're supporting is going um, live 1-1 one, one, or chose 1-1 one, one as their date for open enrollment, then um, the credentials should be coming out soon. So just wait for those before you try to log into the app. You sign up for Evie, you can use the phone instead if you change your mind. Yeah, so there's no problem with people having you, having the Evie app and then choosing to use IVR, the i3 system, to call in and log a shift for whatever reason. Um, my understanding is they're interchangeable, so people could have credentials for both, um, and, you know, if you wanted to in case your um, you know, phone died or something like that. Will every app and every portal be live before one one? Yes. Um, so people should be able to get in prior to then. Can a care provider approve time for their own entries? No, that would be done by the participant. Um, and you know, again, whatever support the participant wants to do that, but um, the participant is, has the account that can go in and do that. Is time being paid by the exact minute? No, time is rounded um, per DDA guidelines on rounding. So um, anything that's eight minutes gets rounded up to 15 minutes, seven minutes and below is considered de minimis and rounds to zero. Um, and so time rounds to 15 minute increments from there on. Is time submitting using Ivory approved in the FMS portal? Yes. A support burger, I'm surprised it took us this long to get to this question. Can the support burger have access to their own username to the system so they can oversee that a participant is following through on managing the shift approvals? So at this time, support brokers are not, uh, will not have access. Um, we're looking at giving support brokers read only access if a participant requests that for their support broker um, or another sort of representative or whatever. Um, but at this point, we just want to take the system live with the participant you know, approvers. And so we'll, um, we'll, we'll follow back up with more details on, on that type of like read only access later. Someone feels like, so my question wasn't clear. Um, can employee choose how they wish to log in and out for a shift by using the EVI app or the telephonic option? Yes, the employee can choose um, which option they prefer to use. Assuming that the participant uh, has a phone number and shares that with us, if a participant, for whatever reason, doesn't have a home phone or cell phone available, then they could essentially require, I mean, every participant is the employer, right? So if the employer um, chooses, you know, how they want, whatever they want their employees to do, then that's sort of the rule, right? So if they say, I want my employees to use one system or the other, um, or one aspect of the system, that's up to the employer. But in terms of the system's functionality, it is possible for people to have different ways of clocking in and out. Can employee enter the EVV system on their own smartphones? Yes, and that would be ideal is if people just kept the app on their phone so they'd clock in when they start working with the person and clock out. So I know we're beyond time. Um, I'll go a little longer. Um, I don't want to like cut anyone off, but um, but I um, I do realize we're gonna have to wrap up here soon. So it seems there's a lot of confusion on timing. It seems that all time for all shifts should be recorded using EVI or IVR, regardless of the type of shift. Is EVI compliance? Yes. So if, regardless of whether or not that service needs to be EVV compliant, you should use EVI to record the time. So the state has been clear that they, they want people to start using the electronic timekeeping system EVI. And you know, for, that's, for, that's a, you know, what it's called for us as an FMCS. 
or two other vendors and they use a, a similar system with probably different names. Um, and so all time should be electronically submitted using this system. Whether or not a given service needs to be EVV compliant for the state and whether it um, needs to be EVV compliant. So personal supports ultimately should be EVV compliant, but day one, it can be manually time entered, which means it's not EVV compliant, but it is coming through that system. And that's, that's the first sort of milestone. The state is saying everyone has to use the electronic timekeeping system. Um, and then whether or not it's EVV compliant, uh, a particular shift is something that will be sorted out in terms of the, the window that they're allowing shifts to not be compliant. And then the, the process they'll go through if someone is not compliant past that window. Um, yeah, I, sorry. So all, all these questions are pretty much um, have been answered um, at least once. Um, so to clarify, all time except personal sports and respite can be entered in manually by participant if needed. Uh, yes, that is true. Even personal sports and respite on day one could be entered manually because again, the, the window that DDA is allowing time to um, essentially is allowing non EV compliant entries um, is, is through July 1st. So it does need to be entered into the system, but it could be done manually. So it wouldn't be EV compliant, but it would be electronically submitted. Um, again, people have questions about split service codes. You would you would have to log in and out depending on which service you were providing for the participant. Um, however many times that requires, if you start at the home, go out in the community and do, say, community development services, job coaching, and come back and do personal supports, you'd be clocking in and out each time. But that takes like you know seconds on the app to just clock out of a shift and clock into another. Okay. All right. Well, so we're past time, and a lot of the questions I'm seeing um, uh, are are repetitive. So I, again, I would if people didn't if people weren't here for the videos because I think the videos address some of these questions. Um, you know, they're on our website, and I would encourage people to review them. We're gonna have another webinar uh, next week. Um, and again, there's more in-person uh, group or individual training sessions scheduled. So um, please make sure you're on our email list and um, you should have received the emails about those and people should feel free to sign up for those if they feel like they need more hands-on assistance with the technology. Um, and, and when we do those in-person sessions at this point, we're using just test accounts that people can use so they can play with it and, and you know, simulate logging in and out of a shift and or doing a manual entry. Um, and then once people get their credentials, um, you know, again, they'll be able to log in themselves on their own device and take a look at it. So we'll try to, again, we're gonna to try to put all these together. Um, someone asked about how to best share this change with their staff. Uh, I would encourage your staff to go onto the website and watch the appropriate videos in terms of how to log in and then let them know that they should be, you know, receiving their credentials. So a lot, we have a lot of the employees on our email list. Um, so we, when we try to send things out, we send them to participants and employees to the extent it's applicable, but it um, ultimately participants should be sharing all this information with their employees. Um, okay, so I think everything else is repetitive um, and we're over time. So thank everyone for their time today. Thank you guys for logging in. And um, like I said, there's more opportunities to ask questions. We'll try to get frequently asked questions some answers up on our website. Um, and I also encourage people to look at the information on DEA's website um, uh, around this and, and other um, self-directed information, because I think it's important that everyone's up to speed on all this stuff. And um, 
So thank you all and have a happy holiday.